heard a story from the Bible when I was just a little girl about a broken hearted woman who met the Savior of the world. Thought it was just another story. heard a preacher read but as I'm sitting here at home drinking red wine all alone I think that a woman might be because tonight I feel just like the woman at the well wondering how But you want me as I am and that sounds crazy I guess maybe that's why grace is so amazing Staring at that empty bottle I swear I caught a glimpse of him He met me right there at the bottom Turn that wine to living water Taught me how to love again Yeah, tonight I feel just like The woman at the well Wondering how someone could love me When I can't love myself But you want me as I am And that sounds crazy I guess maybe that's why grace is so amazing It's no longer just a story when I read it Cause I've seen it for myself and I believe it Cause tonight I feel just like the woman at the well Well, you want me as I am, and that sounds crazy. I guess maybe that's why grace is so amazing. Just like the story in the Bible I heard when I was just a girl. I was the broken-hearted woman. Met the Savior of the world. Great, thank you. This week over dinner, I was talking to a retired radiologist, and I said to him, Glenn, do you really miss the hospital setting? And he gave me some words, I think. He said, he thought for a minute, and he looked right at me, and he said, I don't miss the rat race, but I sure miss the rats. <laughs> you are not rats. Don't, <laughs> don't take that analogy too far. <laughs> but I really appreciate the relationship I've had with, uh, especially with Ken, and the fact that there is just no tension about me coming and going back and forth here once in a while and the relationship we've had through the whole year and with so many of the staff we've kept in touch and it's just been a really a wonderful transition relationship probably one of the best in united methodist history <laughs> from what i understand and I, i'm so grateful for that i understand that you have been in a series called something's in the water and so I want to share the last principle of the series with you today, and it is called Water is for Everyone. Water is for Everyone. Something's in the water. Uh, just a few weeks ago, my son Ben and, uh, and I were invited to go out on a charter boat 
with a, a family for this kid's 15th birthday and his dad. And, and it was one of those nights when <clears throat> on Lake Michigan, the wind was coming from the north. So it was going the opposite direction and it was kind of rough and there were no other charter boats out there. <laughs> And maybe one, and um, it was probably it was one of those nights he shouldn't have gone out. But the captain must have needed a paycheck, I'm guessing, because we went out anyway. About 30, mi 30 minutes out of hitting these waves, we're like boats like this. You know, my stomach is starting to churn. And I've been out on boats before, never had a problem. 45 minutes out, I was so sick. <laughs> and for the next five hours. The dad said, let's go back. And I'm like, no, we're not ruining this kid's birthday. I'll, I'll make it, you know, for five hours. I was the sickest I think I've almost ever been. And, um, and so then I had to lean over the boat a few times, you know, and Ben's holding onto my clothes and there's <laughs> definitely something in the water. <laughs> and I shouldn't have told you that because it was a north wind. So it all came down to Grand Haven where you were swimming, you know. <laughs> Anyway, something is definitely in the water. I want to just talk to you today about thirst. Thirst has different kinds of meanings, doesn't it? I want to talk to you about the thirst that sometimes exists in our souls, not so much just in the back of our throats. Um, when I was, when Cornerstone launched, there were about 25 people and I remember I used to pray, God, if you will just give us 100 people, we will feel like there's a crowd. And suddenly, after the first weekend, we had 120 people. And so then I changed my prayer. God, would you just please help us to get to like 300 people? We'll be larger than most United Methodist churches. And after a few years, we got to 350 people. And then I changed my prayer. God, if you will just help us to get our own building and move out of South Christian High School, then we can have church seven days a week. I mean, we can do all kinds of things. And God provided a beautiful spot on 68th Street with 10 acres of ground. And, and, about, and, and the attendance doubled like overnight. And suddenly we were six or 700 people. And then I changed my prayer again. <laughs> my God, if you'll just help us to get to 1,000. I never dreamed I'd be a pastor of 1,000 people. And, and after a few more years, we went right past 1,000 to about 1,200. And it was at that time that um, I asked our bishop if Ken Nash could come and pastor with me here at Cornerstone. And I promised the bishop, we'll get to 3,000 if you send Ken Nash here with, if we can do this together. And then I changed my prayer again. I'm like, God, if you'll just help us to get a bigger location. I mean, this is only 10 acres. And we need a, like a home base that's bigger than that. And so some wonderful, incredible, uh, skilled folks in our church, and, it's, and some amazing things happened, and we got this 38-acre site in this beautiful facility, and, and I think you see the point. I was praying for good stuff. There's nothing wrong with that thirst, but it was just slightly off. And I was sitting one day having my devotions, and many times pastors get caught up in the trap of reading the Bible, thinking about the next message you're going to preach, or the next class you're going to teach. And I was sitting there kind of in that prep mode, still thirsting, you know, for more, and, and it was almost like God just spoke to me and said, would you just stop? Your thirst isn't necessarily bad. Thirst don't have to be bad. It's just off. Would you just thirst for me? Just thirst for me. It was almost like Jesus said, just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that you're praying about, they'll, they'll happen, don't worry about it. I think that was like a turning point moment for me because I'm guessing that there's a thirst inside of every single one of you. If you were really honest and maybe you haven't even thought about it that way, but down deep, we thirst for things. And oftentimes they're good things, sometimes bad things, but many times good. If I could just find a soulmate, if I could just get pregnant, if I could just be more accepted by the popular kids, you know, if I could just make about $15,000 more a year, then I'd be happy. <laughs> 
I'll be satisfied. If I could just have more discipline, if I could just be recognized, if I could just have more followers, if I could just find community, if my body was just different, if I could just feel accepted, if I could just find my purpose, if I could just get my parents to love me for who I am. And the list goes on, that's not a complete list, but thirst runs deep inside of us. And I would just ask you, and again, you may have never thought about it in those terms, but what are you thirsting for? What's like that deep soul desire that you have? You know, this isn't a new thing. In the Bible, people are thirsty for all kinds of things. And one day, Jesus met a woman, and Rachel just sang about her, in a really out-of-the-way place in this northern district called Samaria, and it was beside a well. And I want to share with you uh, what came out of that. You can read the whole story in John chapter 4 in the Bible, and I'd really encourage you because it's a lot of verses, and it's a great story. I'm going to highlight just some of them in it. As I read through it, I want to make just a couple of observations that I think are truth for our lives that really will apply to you right where you are right now and what you're thinking about as you start to think right now about your own thirst. The first one is this. Jesus has an appointment with you. Jesus has an appointment with you. Not unlike the day Jesus spoke to me in that chair I was sitting in having my devotions, Jesus had an appointment with a woman and she didn't even realize it. In John chapter four, verse four, it says this, now Jesus had to go through Samaria. The, the operative word there is the word had, had. He literally didn't have to go through Samaria. There was all kinds of roads around Samaria. In fact, no good Jewish rabbi would ever walk through Samaria. Jewish rabbis would go 20 miles out of their way to get around Samaria because there was so much racial tension. There was so much, what they would have called theological differences. They wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans and they would always go around, but Jesus had to go through because he had an appointment with a woman with a really, really deep thirst that she was trying to satisfy in all kinds of other ways. What I love about this is that Jesus knows us so well that he tries to find us when we're not even asking him to. We're not even inviting him, and he shows up. Like he surprised me that day. He'll surprise you in different ways. Does he have an appointment with you today? The second thing that I observed about this passage is that nothing will satisfy your thirst other than Jesus alone. It is really simple. You know, maybe some of you have heard of the great uh, theologian. He was really the first theologian of the Roman church before, when there was still just one church in the fourth century. His name was Augustine, St. Augustine. He wrote a book called The Confessions of St. Augustine, which I read early in my ministry. It had a big impact on me. Augustine says something in that book. He says, every single person alive has the capacity for God, the capacity for God in their hearts, in their lives. He went on to call it, even, he even identified what that capacity was. He said that everybody has a God-shaped hole in their, in their body, in their mind, in their spirit, in their soul. There is a God piece that only God could fill. Augustine said, it can't, he said, we try to fill this God-shaped piece with everything else, and it never really works because we have this God-shaped hole in our soul. He called it the hole in the soul. You know, um, you have one. I have one. And we've tried to fill them with so many different things. We may be only vaguely aware that this is be driven by a thirst inside of us. But many times, you know, we rush out and buy new things thinking that's going to fulfill us. And it does for a little while. And then that shiny thing gets old again. You know, or we move to a new neighborhood. New neighbor is really what we need. And it might be true but it doesn't finally satisfy anything. 
We, we look for new jobs. If I could just get a new job, get rid of these people that I work with, you know, make a little bit more money. Some people drink alcohol, trying to fill that hole and medicate that hole. Some people eat comfort food. They just keep eating. Some people search through more pornography, just trying to fill that hole, that thirst. Some people exercise even harder, excessively. And in extreme cases, seek a new spouse. We all have different kinds of thirsts. Advertisers are well aware of Augustine's hole in the soul. <laughs> they know this. And so they track us all the time. And they're always trying to sell us things. I heard about one pastor. He was pastor of this small church, and he was really on a pretty small salary. And his wife went out and bought a $350 dress, and he couldn't believe it. She came home. He said, why would you do that? Especially in January, we're still trying to pay off Christmas debt. She started to cry, and she says, I know, I just found myself looking at that dress. And it was almost like the devil whispered in my ear, try it on. And so I tried it on. And I felt like the devil said, you look great in the dress. And the pastor said, well, you know how to treat the devil. You say, get behind me, Satan. She said, I did. And he said, it looks good from back here, too. <laughs> The other day, I saw a marketing piece for an electric Maserati SUV, and I was thinking to myself, this could probably fill the hole in my soul. <laughs> I'm thinking it could, you know? But I know it would only be for a short time. The woman in this story, in John's story, discovered that in the course of the conversation, Jesus actually knew she had this deep down thirst. And maybe she wasn't even quite fully aware of it. This is what it says in the next few verses. So Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And it was about noon. And when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you just give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. You know, when you're in a re remote area of Kenya... You'll see women, I've never seen a man, but I've seen lots of women carrying a, with a, usually a yellow jug. I don't know where they get the yellow jugs from, but they're walking to a well all the time and they're trying to keep their family alive. And they'll always come early in the morning or they'll go late in the evening, never in the blazing noon sun. But this woman is coming at noon. We find out later in the story that this woman's deep, deep thirst in her life is just for love. Literally, she's thirst for love. Will someone please just love me? And this thirst causes, causes her to have one relationship after another, after another, after another, after another, because it never really fully satisfies her. Those relationships with uh, village men apparently caused a lot of problems with village women in this little town uh, because she's coming at noon. And that just means she doesn't want to see anybody else. She didn't want to be there early in the morning, late in the evening. She's coming at noon. There is a lot of resentment likely for her, probably outright hate for her. And you can feel her surprise that a Jewish man is sitting by the well, a rabbi even, he must have had some kind of markings on his clothing, because she says in verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. You know, there was a regulation that Jewish rabbis could not even speak to another woman in public unless it was their wife. They were not allowed to even talk to another woman. And so imagine her surprise when he asked for a drink. So he catches her off guard and he reveals why he had to come through Samaria and meet her this day. Verse 10 says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And suddenly it begins to dawn on her, this stranger is, is not talking about H2O. There's something else going on here. She's not quite sure what. I was thinking about this passage <clears throat> a few weeks ago and I met a man up at Epworth in the Epworth community who told me 
He said, I've been sober for six years. And he said, I used alcohol and other kinds of drugs almost all my life to try to medicate the fact that I grew up in this really dysfunctional family. And I tried to forget about it and I tried to not deal with it. Until my sponsor in AA introduced me, not just to a higher power, but literally to Jesus Christ. And he said, I drank from the living water for the first time. Jesus continues, verses 13, 14. Everyone who drinks this water is gonna be, this water in the well will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give him will become a spring of water welling up on the inside to eternal life. I think what's tricky here is when, is when we thirst even for good things, for good things more than Jesus, that thing that we're thirsting for can easily become an idol in our lives. Just for me, like even growing this church was a little bit of idolatry mixed in with that. And maybe your thirst has led you to kind of idolize something that you're going for because it's deeply, you're driven on the inside. An idol is something that, uh, man, they come and go in our lives all the time. I like Tim Keller, pretty well-known pastor and author, says this. He said, an idol is anything that you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I will feel like my life has meaning. And then I will know I have value. And then I will feel significant. But none of these things really satisfy in the long run. Only Jesus does. Only the living water. You know, it sounds kind of churchy. And Ken and I and all of Cornerstone, we've always been against just using churchy language. Because we're not sure people really understand it. It doesn't mean anything about you. But what does it really mean to say, drink from the living water? So what's that mean? I, I, I saw, I, I heard, not saw, but I saw, heard recently from a friend of mine who's a pastor, his name's John, and he explained to me in his life about his thirsts, and it helped give me better perspective. He said, Brad, you know, I have suffered from anxiety my entire life. This is a pastor of a pretty well-known church. And he said, I have not sat by idly. I took it on emotionally. I went and got counseling. I've taken on my anxiety uh, physically. I participate in strenuous exercise. I've, I've, I've taken it on biomedically with certain kinds of meds to help control it. I've taken it on spiritually with daily devotionals. And I said, what, 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 what's the root of your anxiety? He said, I'm just so afraid of uncertainty. You know, I just never know. I mean, will I be a success in ministry? Will my kids be safe? Will we have, meet our financial goals eventually, you know? He knew he was a pastor, and he's supposed to know the answer to these things. And yet he's just being debilitated with anxiety. He said, I was well aware of Ben Franklin's famous quote, nothing is certain except death and taxes, but that didn't seem to help much. <laughs> he said, I was thirsty for just deep down peace. And then one day, God showed him this verse, a few chapters later from John 4 over to John 7, where Jesus, following up on that story, says, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And John said, I decided to get back into counseling. But not only that, I decided to refocus my prayer life on the promises of God. And every day, I made it a pact with, from, with myself that I was, and with God that I was going to go to this devotion chair that I have, and I'm going to sit in the chair, and I'm just going to spend time letting God speak to me. And I'm going to focus on his promises. And every single morning, I'm going to say, God, I am giving you my anxiety today. And he said, I began to drink from the living water just a sip at a time. 
And he says, Brad, you know what? Over time, I have discovered that my faith is growing and my fear is subsiding. Can I tell you I'm certain about everything right now? No, I'm not that certain. But my faith in Jesus is stronger than it's ever been, and my anxiety level has gone down, down, down gradually as I have kept this discipline of drinking from the living water and actually reading the word of God, letting God speak to me. I think that's, in one person's life, that's what it can mean to drink from the living water. And I think as we do that in our own lives, you may not change dramatically in one day, but over time, if you will continue and if you will stay steady of drinking the living water and stay disciplined, you will see that the living water will increase your faith and that God's promises will become more solid in your life. Am I completely certain now? He said, no. But I liked his last line. He said, the great physician is doing his work. I think that's pretty good. John had walked with God a long time, John this pastor, and yet he still had this thirst for peace and certainty. I don't know what your thirst is. Maybe it's something that you can only identify. It's a longing, it's a desire. You haven't even thought about it in those terms before. But here's one of the best things about this passage, the last one I want to share with you, is that Jesus meets us just where we are. I love this. Jesus meets us just where we are. This woman did not have to clean up to meet Jesus. <laughs> she did not have to get her life together. Jesus just accepted her, even when the village people didn't. You know, after I graduated from seminary and uh, Colleen was taking some courses in seminary with me and we, we got this invitation to come to Michigan. We drove up here in the middle of the winter. We actually came here on December 31st. And uh, we moved into this church-owned home and, uh, and started ministry in Michigan on New Year's Day. And I won't even tell you what year because it's a long time ago. But on New Year's Day in the village we were living in, they had a, uh, an antique auction. And we didn't know anything. We didn't know anybody who'd never been to an auction. And Colleen said, I'm going to go over to the auction. So she went over there. <laughs> and she, got, she was a little late. She got a seat in the front row. And there was a fast-talking local auctioneer. And uh, we didn't know it, but this guy had a little bit of a shady reputation. And if you were in the front row bidding, he would see someone in the back and bid you up. You know, he'd take that bid from the back and then bid you up, and you don't know the difference because you're down front, right? So he's, he's pretending he's seeing people in the back. So calling, there's a oak dresser, and we have no furniture. We moved here in a small U-Haul trailer, okay? We have this now three or four bedroom house and nothing to put in it. And so she goes like, well, that oak dresser, you know, doesn't look that great right now, but it, there'll be, you know, and so she bids on it. She puts her card up in the air. And he sees somebody in the back, and he bids her up. And they go back and forth and back and forth, and the townspeople know exactly what he's doing. And finally, somebody just stops it, and she goes, oh, give her the dresser. She's the new preacher's wife. <laughs> so he stops and goes, sold. <laughs> and, and Colleen brings home the dresser, and I start uh, a hobby of refinishing old oak, te oak antique furniture. And... Um, and, and, and she continued to buy stuff at other auctions, and I continued to take the paint off of it, and underneath there was often just these beautiful pieces of oak. And I just thought, you know what, God, God doesn't see the old paint on us. God doesn't see the old stains on us. Just like this woman Jesus met at the well, you know, we may not look like we're in mint condition to anybody else, but God just, he saw this woman for who she was in her heart, not for all the thirsts in her life and not for all the problems she had created, all the wrecked marriages all over that little town. Jesus knew her whole story and she felt so exposed and so vulnerable before him. 
And then she realized that no person, because if you read the rest of the story, and I didn't take time to read it all, she's had five husbands, and she's living with somebody now that's not her husband. So in a very small town, that's a lot of husbands. And there's a lot of talk about her. And she realizes Jesus has not so much judged her, but accepted her, just how she is. And she begins to say to herself, could this be the Messiah, the savior of the world? And Jesus hears her thoughts and he says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. You know, I believe there are different kinds of aha moments in our lives. We don't all have the same kind. But I know that this woman had an aha moment and she took a giant swallow of living water right there and it changed her life. And she said to herself, this is what I've been missing my whole life. I just wanted to be loved. And this is the person that has loved me no matter who I have been. So instead of running away again, she received the living water. You know, I've always been sort of, this is sort of a weird fascination uh, of gravestones and things that people write on gravestones. And um, I was reading a collection of, and some of them were kind of funny. You know, sometimes it's your relatives that put things on your gravestone. You have no say over it, you know. Especially in years gone by, there were things written about people. They don't do it as much anymore. This collection had some, some funny ones like Lester Moore, who was a Wells Fargo agent in the 1880s. He was shot and killed and buried at Boot Hill in Tombstone, Arizona. Isn't that a classic? <laughs> On his gravestone, they wrote, here lies Lester Moore, four slugs from a 44, no less, no more. <laughs> <laughs> in England, there was a gravestone that said, Remember, man, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I, as I am now, so you shall be. Remember this and follow me. <laughs> and somebody had literally written on the tombstone, to follow you, I will not consent until I know which way you went. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote one for this woman at the well. Went down to the well to get a drink and met a man who made me think. That God-shaped hole inside my soul was finally filled, and now I'm whole. The end of the story is so compelling. She runs back into the village to a place where she's hated, despised, and she says, come and meet the man who's told me everything I've ever known, ever done. I think I've met the Messiah. And her testimony is so compelling, people rush from the village out to the well to find Jesus. And it says many Samaritans believed on him that day. So let me just ask you, is there a, a thirst inside of you that maybe has just been a little bit off? It may not be like a wrong thing, might even be for a good thing, but it's not really the thirst for Jesus that you know can finally just satisfy everything else. Is Jesus saying to you, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these other things will come your way as well, but seek me first. By faith, have you ever invited him into your life? Maybe this is your day. Maybe at the next baptism service, it'll be your day. Are you spending time with him every day? Are you allowing the living water to pour into your soul? Why not do it right now? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much that the availability of living water is available to every person on this planet. Real water is very precious in some parts, but living water is here. Some of us have been thirsting a long time. What we really need is you. And let the other pieces fall as they may. Because when we have you, our thirst will be quenched. Let this be the day of commitment to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you. Can we say thank you to Brad? What a gift to be able to be ministered to by him again today. Well, we come to the end of our series. Uh, this um, water is for everyone. Uh, today, um, wrapping up with water is for everyone. This, uh, there's something in the water. We've been learning that, that water truly does quench that thirst. It really does satisfy us. The living water of Jesus Christ is real. One of the things I absolutely love about Cornerstone is that we're strategic in everything that we do organizationally and church-wide. And so what that means is uh, we really um, think through why are we doing what we're doing? Well, um, we believe, as we just heard today, water is for everyone. And so we have um, a mission project that we have been pouring into for many, many years. We go very deep in our mission. And so um, Brad and I have been to northern Kenya in Turkana, um, and there we have dug many, many water wells. Here's one, in fact, uh, as you see this. It's just beautiful to watch that we as a church, as we've pooled our resources together and as we've cared for them, uh, we have literally helped people to have physical thirst met, quenched, so that we're able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here, here's just a short video to show you what we've done in northern Kenya. So we have, uh, we have an event coming up that is uh, like we literally change communities. And that water well, they used to have to go f much further to get water and they would have to actually go down into to deep wells. And uh, so we change lives and then share the gospel with them. We want to continue to, as we come to the end of the series, we thought, um, let, let's uh, continue this idea of how we can care for others. And so we have an event coming up on September 18th at three o'clock, it's called Lug -a Jug. We're gonna do the same thing. It's actually on this property, we're going to do a 6K walk with water, and we're gonna raise support and um, awareness for what we're doing in digging these water wells because we believe, as we learned today, water is for everyone. And we wanna share the gospel and the grace of Jesus Christ with the world. And so I uh, just wanna put that on your calendar as a big announcement coming up as we wrap this series on water together. Thanks for being a part of this series and to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and his living water is real for all of us. So we want to respond right now as we have a closing song as just remembering and celebrating the fact that this grace and this living water is truly for everyone.